My anniversary of ordination is on the Feast of the Epiphany. It comes up here again every year on January 6th. And I can remember how long ago it was because I was at least seven, almost eight months pregnant with our third child. So I always think of what age she is, and that's how I know which ordination anniversary it is. So coming up here in this January, it'll be 18 years that I have been serving God in the church as a priest in his church. I remember some key parts of that service so vividly. And one point was at the conclusion of worship, right at the end, as we were, as the bishop had just finished administering communion to the last person and was heading back to the altar where the elements would be put away and he would lead the post-communion prayer, he says to me in passing, you give the blessing. This is something that the priest does, and I had not thought to be prepared for this. I turned to my friend beside me and thought, and said to her, like, how does it start again? I don't even know, I can't remember what the words are. And is this in the Book of Common Prayer? Like, can I look it up on a page real quick? I'd heard the blessing over and over and over again, the most familiar one. So I hoped that if I got it started, at least maybe perhaps the words would come to me. And they did. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's the peace that follows the blessing of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Peace is something that we long for, to be sure. But what is this peace that we desire? You all might remember the Seinfeld episode where George's father was having a stressful time and he had read something about saying serenity now to invite that peaceful experience. But as you recall, the hilarity of that episode was how furious and um, uh, eager or um, combative he claimed it. <laughs> serenity now, he would scream, serenity now! This is not the peace that God has to offer us. Because the peace that God has to give, God gives to us. We don't need to claim it or to pull at it or to hold fast to, us, to it because it's God's peace that holds fast to us. We often think of peace as an absence of conflict. We skate around on the surface of our lives. We hope for speed and agility and at the very least, talent to ever avoid falling. What we find in life is that falling is inevitable. It's unavoidable. Even the most talented and practiced fall. Furthermore, if the ice cracks and breaks, we're in trouble. I can tell you, friends, that the peace of God, which is offered to us in Jesus Christ, doesn't become diminished in the falls and fractures of our lives. When the surface of life cracks and the depths below are revealed, we would say that that is when the peace of God is most certainly needed, and indeed it is offered. John's Gospel speaks of peace in ways that are so vivid to our ears because we hear them quite regularly. In John 14, a scripture passage that's often read at a funeral, we hear Jesus say to his disciples, peace I leave with you, my own peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Or in John 20, when Jesus comes back after the resurrection into that locked upper room with the disciples that are fearful, he breathes on them, and he says, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Yes, this is the peace we are offered in Jesus Christ, the peace that settles our troubled heart, that releases us from fear, the peace that liberates us from the sins that we carry, both our own and the sins of others. So what do we need to repent from 
in order to receive this peace, in order to find this peace right before us, presented right there within, within our reach. To repent is to turn. And so when we talk about repent, repenting, we think, what do we need to turn away from in order to turn toward what God has to give us? I believe that we need to repent to turn away from hating our enemies. We need to repent from simplistic thinking. We need to repent from the laziness about delivering the good news. Hating our enemies is born out of self-righteousness and the emotional high of justification. It can also be born from fear. I'm sure that it's obvious to you of how binding hate can be. We are so unpracticed in what to do with our enemies that we are tempted to hate them, or if we don't want that, to try to cancel them. Any of our enemies are obviously wrong, right? And we, whoever we are, are obviously right, right? Such simplistic thinking binds us further. So perhaps you're now wondering if I'm promoting an anything goes attitude. And I wanted to ask you, is that what the options are? An either or thinking or an anything and everything goes thinking? Why is it we're so tempted to simplistic thinkings? I want us to turn to Bonhoeffer to give us some clear direction that does not simplify the good news of Jesus. In the passage from Bonhoeffer's book, The Cost of Discipleship, that I'm going to read uh, some portions of in a moment, he is referring to the 10th chapter of Matthew, which, interestingly enough, mirrors the 10th chapter in Luke. That makes it easy to remember, doesn't it? Matthew 10 and Luke 10 both have Jesus sending his disciples out two by two to the places that he is going to go. And he instructs them of what to do. He tells them to take nothing with them, no purse, no second coat, no shoes, but to enter into the house and to say, peace be with you. And if people receive that peace, you should stay there. And if they refuse that peace, then leave. Shake the dust from your shoes and head on to the next place. He sends them to prepare for his coming. The disciples are supposed to say the kingdom of God is at hand. The word is coming here. In Bonhoeffer's book, The Cost of Discipleship, in the third section, which he has entitled The Messengers, he has a chapter in it entitled The Work. And he writes this about this particular passage, Matthew 10. The work of God cannot be done without due authorization, otherwise it's devoid of promise. The love of Jesus is something very different from our own zeal and enthusiasms, because the love of Jesus adheres to God's mission. It is only the Lord's commission which can show us the place where the promise lies. If Christ will not let us preach the gospel in any particular place, we must give up the attempt and abide by his will and word. Thus the disciples are bound to the word and to the terms of their commission. They can only go where the word of Christ and his commission direct them. And so they do. And what is, it the, what is the work that Jesus calls them into as they enter into these homes, as they declare the peace of the Lord? They are to be about the work of healing and redemption. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, Jesus tells them. This is not surface work. This is work of the deep. And Jesus empowers his disciples to be messengers of him, of the good news that he is, as they pronounce that the kingdom of God is at hand. Bonhoeffer says, the proclamation and activity of the messengers are identical with that of Christ himself. To them, the disciples, has been granted a portion of Jesus' power. They are charged to proclaim the advent of the kingdom of heaven and to confirm their message by performing signs. They must heal the sick, cleanse the lepers. They must raise the dead and drive out devils. Devils. 
the message becomes an event, and the event confirms the message. The kingdom of God, Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins, the justification of this sinner through faith, all this is identical with the destruction of the devil's power, the healing of sick, and the raising of the dead. The proclamation of the apostles is the word, capital W, of the Almighty God. And therefore, it is an act. It is an event in itself. It is a miracle. It is the one Christ who passes through the land in the person of his 12 messengers and performs his work. The sovereign grace with which they are equipped is the creative and redemptive word of God. What word are we waiting? We are awaiting the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. We started with Mark's gospel this morning, Mark 1, the very first words in Mark's gospel. If you recall the very first words in John's gospel, it is these, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. This is what we proclaim in this Advent season. And so Bonhoeffer goes on to write about this passage in Matthew. He says, as they enter the house, they are to use the same word of greeting as their master. Peace be to this house. This is no empty formula, for it immediately brings the power of the peace of God on those who are worthy of it. Their proclamation, the disciples' proclamation, is clear and concise. All they have to do is simply announce that the kingdom of God has drawn nigh and summon the people to repentance and faith. The king stands at the door, and he may come in at any moment. Will you bow down and humbly receive him, Bonhoeffer asks, or do you want him to destroy you in his wrath? Those who have ears to hear have heard all there is to hear. They cannot detain the messengers any longer, for they must be off to the next city. The messengers must be off to the next city. If, however, the men in the house refuse to hear, they've lost their chance. The time of grace is past, and they have pronounced their own doom. This is evangelical preaching. Is this ruthless speed? Bonhoeffer asks. Nothing could be more ruthless than to make men think there is still plenty of time to mend their ways. To tell men that the cause is urgent, that the kingdom of God is at hand, is the most charitable and merciful act we can perform, the most joyous news we can bring. And so we might be wondering, how is it then that so often the good news or those that seek to proclaim it come off as anything but the good news? How could that be? Maybe you're thinking to yourself, how is it that I don't want to proclaim the good news? Why is it that I feel like I would be burdening people with that? I believe that it is because we often make the mistake of thinking that the work of the Spirit is our work. We think that we have to change our enemies. But that is not the instruction. The instruction is to love them. We often equate righteousness with simplistic thinking, that a clarity that ignores complexity and ignores the fact that God is unknown. But no, 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 God says. Righteousness is about living in relationship with the complex and unknowable God. Righteousness is a humbling activity. My friends, too often I see us trying to be God in the work of transformation, in the work of conversion, and that is not our work. Our work is to go ahead to the places where Jesus is coming and to speak God's peace. Matthew and Luke's gospel both say that when the me message of peace is refused, then to shake the dust from your feet and move on. This gesture reminds us that we are not attached to God's saving work. That if someone refuses it, then that person is in God's hands for the next step. 
Actually, in both cases, it's true, but to turn and to go on to the next house, to speak the words of peace, that's our task. We are not to linger and to try to convince or to persuade or to cajole someone into believing. No, we shake the dust from our shoes and we move on. It is God's justice that will attend to them. Bonhoeffer says, the messenger cannot wait and repeat it to every man in his own language. God's language is clear enough. It is not for the messenger to decide who will hear and who will not hear, for only God knows who is worthy to hear. And those who are worthy will hear the word, capital W, when the disciple proclaims it. But woe to the city and woe to the house which rejects the messenger of Christ. To refuse to believe in the gospel is the worst sin imaginable, and if that happens, the messengers can do nothing but leave the place. They go because the word, capital W, cannot remain there. And they must recognize, the messengers must recognize, in fear and amazement, both the power and the weakness of the word of God, capital W. But the disciples must not force any issue contrary to or beyond the word of Christ. The disciples' commission is not a heroic struggle, a financial pursuit of a grand idea, or a good cause. I think that last sentence bears repeating. The commission of the disciples is not a heroic struggle. It's not up to them. It's not up to us to try to save the world. The work and the commission of the disciples is not a financial pursuit of a grand idea of a, or a good cause. They were not trying to build an establishment or to create an institution and thus trying to get their supporters all rallied together, coaxing and cajoling and convincing people to come around this grand idea. No, that's not their work, and it's not ours either. The commission that the disciples had then is the commission that we have now, and it's to go to the places where Jesus is going to go, to bring God's peace and to tell them that Jesus the word of God is coming. If we encounter people who refuse the peace of the Lord, then we will refuse the, they will refuse the disciples and Jesus has instructed them to shake the dust from their shoes and leave, knowing that the peace that you brought with you will return to you. Nothing is lost for you. And this is how the good news becomes joyful because we go into places where God is going to come and we speak the peace of the Lord. We tell folks that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that the word, capital W, of God is coming. This is what John the Baptist did as we read about it in Mark's gospel this morning. He went out into the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance and people came far and wide and asked him what he was about. He said, I'm preparing the way. One is coming after me whose sandals I can't even be found worthy to tie. He is the one that you want to receive. Make way to hear the good news of the word, capital W, of God. This word changes our lives. We are not the same when we encounter our Savior. Everything gets changed. Repentance is something we joyfully do. We turn from our ways of wickedness to the ways of life. Last night, I finished reading James McBride's book, The Good Lord Bird. And for those of you that like a good piece of fiction, I'm not going to spoil it for you. But I will tell you that I found it a fantastic illustration of one who knew the transformation of God in Christ. The Good Lord Bird is about John Brown, the one who made a raid on Harper's Ferry in an effort and in a belief that the Negro should be free. This was in the first half of the 19th century, around 1845 to 1859, somewhere around there. And the whole story of the Good Lord Bird is told from a young adolescent, mid, middle adolescent black boy who is either kidnapped or rescued by John Brown. 
You're not quite sure because he becomes an orphan in a brawl um, as the result of a brawl that took place in a tavern that John Brown started, which ultimately killed this boy's father. And so the whole story is told through this young man's eyes. And he speaks of John Brown's fervor in spirit, his conviction that God is with him. It's an incredible story, and because of the way it's written, I don't have any desire to see the film. You can tell that James McBride knows about what it means to have a life transformed and how it makes you sound crazy, because John Brown sounds crazy. And the boy who narrates the story says that time and again. But at the end, and I promise not to spoil it, at the end, the boy comes to John Brown before he is set to be hanged. And the boy is burdened by the fact that what John Brown set out to do didn't come to completion. He thinks it's a failure. He thinks John Brown is a failure. But in beautiful, beautifully written words, you hear John Brown recognize that he's just part of this long story of God's salvation and that if he didn't get to see the work completed, it doesn't mean that it won't be brought to completion. And here you hear a life of faith, one which is lived in full earnestness and eagerness, not in any tidy way, but filled with the conviction that God wants to redeem all people. God wants to redeem all of creation. And God knows that our salvation is bound up in one another, and so God waits for us to come along. It reminds me of the words from 2 Peter that we read today. Do not ignore this fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. And at the end of that passage from this morning, he says, regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. Yes, John the Baptist came proclaiming that the Messiah was coming. And if you remember, he did not live to see Jesus resurrected from the dead. He was beheaded before Jesus went to trial and was killed in the crucifixion. John the Baptist didn't get to see what God was up to in Jesus the Christ. And just to orient you to the passages of scripture we read today, the experience of John the Baptist and Jesus, the time in which they lived, was from about zero-ish common era to around 30. And after 30, after Jesus' resurrection, the first pieces of scripture that were written were the letters of Paul. For 10 or 15 years, that's really all that people were circulating about who this Jesus was, the savior of the world. And somewhere around 60, the Gospels began to be written, Mark being the first one. So you see, there's this whole big gap between when Jesus was raised from the dead and when the Gospel of Mark was written down and the other Gospels followed. The second lead letter of Peter is thought to maybe at the earliest be written at 60, but probably more like 80 to 90 of the Common Era. So the, Peter, the letters of Peter and the Gospel of Mark are speaking to people who are saying, when is Jesus coming back? He said he would be back soon. Why isn't he here? What are we to do with the waiting? I saw in a, an education book for young children a tool to help us conceive of the time of God. It was an illustration of taking 30 meters of grow grain ribbon, or gross grain ribbon. I'm not sure how you say it. I say it grow grain ribbon. Now, if you don't know what grow grain ribbon is, it's ribbon with the little ridges. And um, the instruction was to take 30 meters of this grow grain ribbon, because that is the span of time since God spoke into the abyss until our day now. And with that grow grain ribbon, each rib is a thousand years. Imagine 30 meters of ribbon. When you look at the last two ribs of 30 meters of ribbon, you see that we are in the end times. We are right here. From when Jesus came, we're still right here at the very end. Our concept of time can be thwarted or diminished or skewed because we forget the time of God. 
and that God is bringing about salvation of all creation. Eusebius of Emesa, the bishop of Emesa from around 339 to his death, and his dates are believed to be 300 to 359, he wrote these words about the second letter of Peter that we read today, this first, this first line of scripture. Eusebius of Emesa wrote this. Scripture says that human life is short and full of trouble, but you belong to the unseen and eternal one. And a thousand years are like a single day, or even like a watch of the night. It is during the fourth watch that those who are entrusted to guard it are divided, and it was during that watch that the Lord came to the holy apostles. If he has spoken this way about a thousand years, it is clear that the lifespan of a man is extremely short. The day of the Lord is like a thousand years and yet is undivided. No one lives for thou a thousand years, but no one has known a full day of the Lord either. To drive this point home in one more illustration before I close, I want to share with you a couple of paragraphs from a magazine that I, was, that I subscribed to. It's called Plow Quarterly. It is a publication of the Bruderhof Communities, which is an Anabaptist Christian movement that was founded in Germany in 1920. I always find it um, full of things that get me thinking in some really ways that I hadn't before. And in this particular article, written by Ross Duthat, who is a columnist for the New York Times and the author of several books, he writes about this understanding or lack of understanding and the provision of God in the midst of it. He is reflecting on the birth of their fourth child, Rosemary, and he writes these words. Rosemary was conceived in the summer of 2019. In the winter of 2020, I brought COVID-19 home to my family from a book tour, and our other three children and my seven months pregnant wife got sick. Rosemary was born amid the first wave of the pandemic. Her birthday matches the exact late April peak of deaths for our home state of Connecticut. After we brought her back from the hospital, healthy and cheerful, I thought about what would have happened if news from 2020 had fallen back through a wormhole in 2019. I imagined this. Guess what? Before you conceive another child, you should know that there will be a pandemic next year. The economy will shut down. There will be riots and a crime wave, and you'll all get sick with the virus deep into your wife's pregnancy. He reflects, would Rosemary have been conceived in the shadow of that foreknowledge? Would we have ma made the leap of faith? And so, my friends, beloved, we live in these end times, these last days, and we live them in the peace of Christ, trusting that the Lord's delay is for our salvation. We do the hard work of entering into the difficult situations where the Lord himself will go. We proclaim the peace of the Lord, and those who receive it will be transformed. And if they don't, we need not worry, for God will complete the work that God has set out to do the work that God only knows how to do and knows how to do perfectly. We can entrust it all to God's care. And in doing so, the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of Christ, our Savior. Amen.